Welcome to our viewers at the University of Maryland and other locations. We are so glad that you could join us today. My name is Hoda Mahmoudi and I'm the holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland. I'm pleased to say that today's program is co-sponsored with the Critical Race Initiative in the Department of Sociology and in the College and by the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. I would like to also thank uh, the assistant uh, administrative, administrative assistant at the Baha'i Chair, Dr. Kate Seaman, for all of her work in organizing today's program. And of course, a warm welcome to Professor Richardson, whom I will introduce in a minute. Uh, let's, I have to go over some technical matters. So when you join this program, you are muted and the video is turned off. And please note that the program is being recorded. So by participating, you acknowledge uh, and consent to your image, likeness, or voice possibly being recorded. We ask that you use the Q&A, uh, which is the function is at the bottom of your screen at the end of the official program when we open up the session for your questions. The Baha'i Chair for World Peace explores social problems and barriers to human rights, to uh, equality, peace, and security. We pursue a body of tested knowledge that can be used to seek a more just, secure, sustainable society, whether it's at the local level, all the way up to the international. In our pursuit of knowledge, we always, we always take into consideration the important role of shared human values, some would call these spiritual values, or ethical and moral considerations that form the foundation for creating a better society. The Baha'i Chair promotes this vision through an intensive learning process focused on five central themes, the equality of women, structural racism and the root cause of prejudice, the challenges of global governance, and the challenges of, the, of climate change and the environment. And what informs all of these themes is our understanding, better understanding of human nature. Today's lecture, of course, falls under the structural racism theme. And um, I'd like to just say a note about the subject of today's lecture by Professor Richardson. The presentation addresses the difficult topic of the intersection of gun violence, mass incarceration, and trauma among violently injured young black men and the ways structural and interpersonal affect their lives. It wouldn't be right to not directly address the solemn, serious, heartfelt, difficult, personal work that Dr. Richardson is engaged in. Not all scholarly work is so deeply personal or difficult or grapples with the knotty questions of history, culture, violence, life, and death. To conduct such work is not only to do important scholarship, it is to hedge, guard, and extend one's own moral references one's own semiotics of moral sustainability, or to put it all in plain language, this is hard work and it comes at a cost. In such things, pause, a pause to recognize the humanity in others and in our own colleagues is warranted. It is my pleasure to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Dr. Professor, Dr. and Professor Joseph Richardson. He is the Joel and Kim Feller Professor of American, African American Studies and Anthropology and a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health in the Division of Preventative Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is the executive director of the Transla Translational Research and Applied Violence Intervention Lab, an interdisciplinary violence research lab that uses a translational science where uh, practitioner, policymakers, and researchers collaborate together 
to address gun violence and trauma. Dr. Richardson's work focuses primarily on the intersection of the healthcare and cl criminal justice systems among young black male survivors of non-fatal violent firearm injury in Baltimore, Maryland, and in Washington, DC. He is the executive producer of the digital storytelling project, Life After the Gunshot, which documents the lives of 10 black, young black male survivors of gun violence. He is also the co-founder and former director of the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program, a hospital-based violence intervention program at the University of Maryland, Prince George's County Hospital Center. The title of his talk is Life After the Gunshot, a digital storytelling telling project on the impact of structural and interpersonal violence and the healing process for young black men. Welcome, Professor Richardson. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm proud to present my digital storytelling project, Life After the Gunshot, uh, which chronicles the lives of 10 young black men who were in, uh, in, uh, injured by firearm injury and treated at the University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center, and then were participants in a hospital-based violence intervention program that I directed there called the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program. This project is important to me and I think would be is going to be important to, to the audience as well to understand not only the humanity of the young men that participated in this project, but also the nuanced lives that they are engaged in. And so um, I have a colleague by the name of William Kellebrew who has always told me that it's best to start out a presentation with a clip. And so the clip that I'm going to present are excerpts from the digital storytelling project. And this ex these clips happen to focus on the psychological trauma, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder and the symptoms of that from young men that have been uh, victims of firearm injury. But I also want to add in, in, in addition, these are also young men that have been involved in the criminal justice system. And as I will show you throughout this presentation, the ways that the healthcare and criminal justice system intersect to impact the lives of these young black men. Many people may see or have asked, you know, are these narratives performative? And I would answer, absolutely not. These are narratives that I think can be used to inform people who are unaware of the lives of these young men and the trauma that they experience, not only from uh, the criminal justice system and the, and the healthcare system, but actually what they experience societally. And so I will uh, begin the presentation with clips that focus on post-traumatic stress and the ways that these young men express post-traumatic stress in their own language, not language that's defined by clinically by the DSM-5, but in the ways that they express traumatic stress in, in ways that are similar to a soldier who was experienced combat in Iraq, Afghanistan, or Syria. These are similar symptoms that they express as well. And so um, I look forward to the, this presentation and your questions afterwards. I still got dreams, you know what I'm saying? I still want what I want, but I ain't gonna be able to get there by being in the house, you know what I'm saying? I can't just dwell on it. So me knowing that and knowing what I know, if you have my brain running, just running like, you gotta do something, you know what I'm saying? What you gonna do? Do you think talking to somebody that was like a therapist, that was professional and dealing with issues like that would be helpful? I really didn't know. Cause I'm from where you don't talk about shit. Everything is on murder. You keep it quiet. Stay to yourself with it. You hold it in. You know what I'm saying? 
I never had no father. I don't know about talking to another man about me. You dig me? So, I really didn't know. I don't know. I only talked to him one time. And we just, he was just figuring me out, basically. It wasn't really a, I just was telling him what I've been through, like how I'm doing now. Hopefully he got something that I, that had me keep coming back to next time I see him. You feel like you want to come back? Yeah. I feel like I need to. Like, I, I, so I be thinking about my daughter, man. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to be fucked up way I'm fucking her up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't got it all for her. As far as me. Not financially, not... Nothing, nothing, nothing like that. Just as far as my emotions, my mental, for her. If they say that this can help me on them type of times, then I'm all in, you know what I'm saying? If I was sleeping and somebody was already in the room without knocking, like, I just, I spazzed on them, I got mad at them, you feel me? Like, I felt like they was like creeping, I like, cause it's like the same instant that night, somebody crept around and hit me, so, you feel me, if somebody was doing anything that they didn't really like, I guess voice out loud, like if they was bringing me food or if they was coming in there to turn the light off or something, I just woke up and it was in there, like, I don't know, like, I was spazzing out. I remember I went to the mall, they tried to take me to the mall, they tried to get me in a regular routine, I went to the mall, I'm like, it could be somebody going in their pocket to get their phone, like, I'm on alert, like, I'm watching what's about to come out your pocket, or like, they, uh, I had to go to, um, like, I got an infection, so I had to go back to the hospital after that, and I think it was, that's, it was close to the time where that, it was a guy that shot uh, in Las Vegas, he shot all them people up, mm -hmm. so I'm sitting in the lobby, if I, at first I was comfortable, I'm sitting in the lobby just talking to my girl, I get to looking around, and, like, I just, it's like I started judging myself, I'm like, you too comfortable now, you feel me? So, I didn't even wait for the nurse to come, call my name, never. I just, we just went right back out. That's how, that's how bad it got me, you feel me? I'm just thinking, like, anybody could do anything right now. I got a baby coming, man. Well, I gotta stop doing what I'm doing, man. Mm -hmm. But see, I had that pro that thought process before. But see, you know, niggas from the streets, like, Bree was saying earlier, man, niggas like, niggas like us love the shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's the excitement of the shit, being out there. You know what I'm saying? Like me, it, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a the feeling of it, man. Yeah, so it's addictive. It's addictive. It's a drug. Yeah, it's addictive. Make you want to keep going. At the, the, the head and the shit, and you, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, that's kind of uh, but no, that's that's still the topic of when you got hit. Okay. So when you came home, right from the mm -hmm. hospital, how was you feeling mentally and physically? Mentally, uh, physically I was fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Mentally. I was like, okay, I know what this, I know what we about to do now. I know what, it, I know what it's about to transpire too. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, me being me, I ain't staying in the house. I mean, I went outside with the goddamn braces in my mouth, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I want to see what's going on now. Mm -hmm. It's time to see what's going on out here. Mm -hmm. But I was I was fucked up in the head, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm just wondering, like, you get them thoughts in your mind, like, who and why? Like, but you know why, but you like, who, though? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of shit out there. So who could have caught me slipping like this here this time? I'm never slipping. You know what I'm saying? That's I mean that's those that was running in my mind. Yeah. Car pull up, the end of the parking lot, get the spraying 56 times. All of us got hit. Uh, in the midst of that, we thought it was fireworks. It wasn't. And we started hearing them ricocheted off the wall. It was real. We fell, got back up, kept running. I didn't know I was shot until I got around the corner. Felt a cramp, then my hand got real hot because of the blood. I looked down, I got shot. I passed out about two, three times. Ambulance came, went to the hospital, PG hospital. Got out the next day. It was wartime. After that, looked at everything different. Everybody was against me. That's how I felt in real life. So what you mean when you said you looked at everybody different? What you mean by that? Trust nobody. Nobody. Even with y'all, when y'all called me, trust nobody. Man, it, it changed my whole way of thinking, life, all that. Man, definitely. I'd still be back out in them streets right now. If you didn't get hit? If I didn't get hit.
So you said one way that it changed you. You said it, it didn't trust. You don't trust nobody. But like, what other ways did it did it change you? My attitude, definitely. Uh, my eating habits, my breathing, my anxiety. That mm. mainly anger, though. You, were you more angry after that? Yeah. I'm still working on. We talk a lot about, because you know, you, we know each other, yeah. but we talk a lot about PTSD, right? And that, you know, in our groups and counseling, et cetera, that guys go through PTSD. At any point in time, had you experienced the symptoms of PTSD? Yeah, to this day. Like I what? did this morning when I woke up. Man, just certain things, like I just moved into my own little spot. I hear little noises. I be thinking it's something else, a whole nother ball game. I'm way out Merlin. By the time I get halfway through the hallway, I'll be like, man, lay that ass back down, man. Like, real life, man. I'm getting used to it, man. I'm get, I got to get back used to being comfortable. That's what it is. I was comfortable in the streets. Got shot. Now I got to get comfortable with just chilling. You know what I'm saying? Working, doing what I got to do. That's the first time I ever had a job this long, besides the streets. I still go through nights, you know, on a lot of things except sleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I try to, like, what we talk about in the, in, the, in the group is, you know, coping methods, and I'm working on adjusting my negative coping methods into more positive coping methods. And what I mean by that is, is that, like I said, I stay, I, I still go through nights now, and it's, it's the nights where I go up, I might be up two days straight, on sleep at night, just two days. And it's not, you know, I'm scared to go to sleep, but it's just like, I'm so anxious, I'm so turned up, I'm so, I need something to calm down. Let me go hit this J, or, or Man, I don't want to think about this. Let me forget. Let me go. Let me go drink this Seagrams. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, or shit. I'm down right now. Let me go hit this boot up right quick and come up. You know what I'm saying? Hit the Molly. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I mean. Like those coping methods right there. I'm trying to figure out a way to flip that. Cause right. I still deal with it. I still deal with it. And it's not. I'm not gonna say it's a severe. Severe. To me, I can handle it. But I guess everybody that got PTSD can say they can handle their own. You know what I'm saying? So I can't even tell you if it's bad or not. I go through, I don't have nightmares, but I have, um, I realize loud noises affect me heavily. I remember the first time I heard a gunshot after my incident. First time I heard a loud noise after my incident. First time I had to, uh, <laughs> first time I, I, I smelled gunpowder after my incident. <laughs> it, it was times where I didn't even went around with guns or gunpowder or bullets, anything. And I, I just had the aroma come to me. Just the aroma. Like, hey, yeah. so. I definitely still experience, you know, ordeals. The, the factors that you just reviewed or just heard in terms of PTSD are all, are all situations that young men were expressing in terms of hypervigilance. And you found that, heard that some of the young men said that they were hearing loud noises and they actually made them really nervous. In the last with uh, clip with Sonny, he expressed that he was now uh, abusing substances. And then you heard also with, with uh, in the first clip with Slim, that he was trying to get his life together in order to um, become mentally well for his daughter. And so for these uh, clips, the next few slides I wanna show, on the left, you will see uh, an enslaved laborer who has scars on his back. And those scars are uh, the result of being an oppressive system of slavery. And then you have uh, to the right of him, uh, a chain gang, which is a result of after the abolition of slavery and the new Jim Crow. And then you have to the, to the right of that uh, prison system. And below that, you'll see that is uh, water from the Flint water crisis. And then to the right of that, you'll also see Hurricane Katrina. Well, all of those things have in common are forms of structural violence. And so when we think about the social determinants of health in Washington, DC, these are some of the factors which affect the social determinants of health. You have education, employment, income, housing, and we know that DC has the rap a rapidly gentrifying city, transportation, food deserts that exist primarily in poor uh, 
sections of the city east of the river in Ward 7 and 8, and also Ward 5 as well, and then community safety. And so what I want to uh, offer today is a different way of thinking about violence, and not just violence in terms of interpersonal violence. Uh, violence goes beyond just those forms of violence and, and often can be framed as structural violence. So our traditional ideas of violence goes beyond just the fist, stick, knife, and gun, but also violence that has no author, right? And so violence that kills slowly and violence that kills quickly is often the distinction in how one defines violence. Violence that is anonymous and violence that has an author. So direct violence is usually measured in a number of deaths. One could approach structural violence in the same way, looking at the number of avoidable or avertable deaths that occur because medical and sanitary resources are concentrated in the upper classes. And so for the characteristics of structural violence, we know that it's depersonalized. There are, there's no clear perpetrator. Violence manifests itself as unequal power. And so there are unequal life chances, for example, in the young men that are participating in this project. And then we know that it's ongoing and pervasive and violence is often invisible. Right, the violence is a routine, a routinized part of everyday life, but we know also that structural violence is problematic because it leads to direct violence. And so I want everyone to understand that every year there are 100,000 people that are victims of gunshot wounds that survive. Disproportionately, they're black men. Black men represent 6% of the population, but they're also 50% of all homicide victims but we haven't given enough attention to the structural violence that occurs, which leads to that direct violence, which results in 100,000 people being shot every year, disproportionately black men, and then disproportionately black men who are victims of homicide. So in terms of how structural violence is different from direct violence, structural violence often affects groups where direct violence affects individuals. And structural violence there Although there is a victim, it is caused by the social inequities of society where it's hard to identify the perpetrator. So in terms of the Flint water crisis or mass incarceration or food deserts in Washington, DC or the disproportionate number of black people who live in poverty or the disproportionate number of African-Americans who are affected by the COVID crisis, who are the authors of that kind of violence? It's very hard to identify a criminal behind those, those events and actions. And then in terms of direct violence, we know that there is a perpetrator and then there's also a victim, right? The presence of it is, in, is in, intentional and it is often deemed unacceptable. But that is the distinction between structural and direct violence that one is normalized and often accepted. And then one, because we, we have a different framework for how we perceive violence is considered unacceptable. So I'm currently working with Dr. Tanya Zacherson, who is a trauma surgeon at the University of Chicago and a professor there as well, who has written this very interesting article on the ways that trauma surgeons engage in structural violence. And often I would see in my work in the trauma units um, at the University of Maryland, uh, Prince George's Hospital Center, as well as our Adams Cowley Trauma Center in Baltimore, that in fact, our medical, uh, our medical staff, and which is comprised of maybe ED physicians as well as trauma surgeons, may often engage in, in structural violence as well. And so how can we train our, our trauma surgeons to engage in structural justice and structural competency? So here's a quote from Dr. Zacherson, which basically says and captures that trauma is a political disease. And if you think about trauma as it relates to the COVID-19 epidemic and the number of people that have been killed by the COVID-19 up until up to the present day, which is roughly 255,000 Americans, we know that the COVID epidemic has been politicized in the response by the US government. And so here is a quote from her, which from her article, which says, our profession requires us to fight the challenge for equity for the most vulnerable among us. Being a moral leader means standing up for truth, reason, and science. 
It means not being afraid to stand up for your principles or hold elected leaders accountable for meeting the needs and values of our communities. We have been told that we should shy away from political controversy, but I would say that your obligation from today forward is to stand up for the vulnerable and the voiceless. For example, regards to trauma, no preventable injury can be justified if it, that means engaging in controversy, then do so. We are currently, uh, Dr. Zacherson and I, as well as uh, my faculty research assistant, Dr. Mahir Chahuri, we are currently developing uh, a structural violence and structural competency cu curriculum, which we will be using with trauma surgeons in Chicago and Baltimore to increase the awareness of structural violence that occurs among the patients, often those who have been victims of firearm injury that come into our trauma units and where they return in the communities that they return to that have been impacted by structural violence. And so I wanna provide here uh, a comparison in terms of structural violence. What you see here is the life expectancy of where someone lives can dictate how long they may live and, and the health resources that they may have access to that exp expands their life expectancy. So here in Woodley Park, which is primarily white upper middle class neighborhood in DC, the life expectancy is 89.4 years. But if you travel 10 to 15 minutes across, to, across the river towards seven and eight, St. Elizabeth's, which is predominantly black and poor, the life expectancy is 68.4 years. So in a matter of a 10 to 15 minute drive, you roughly lose 21 years of your life expectancy. In terms of COVID, the black fatality rate in DC is six times higher than the white fatality rate. And this isn't just specific to Washington DC. This is specific, this is, uh, occurring across the country that's disproportionately affecting black communities. In terms of percentage of households earning less than $15,000, as you can see, correlates to the life expectancy. Uh, the, the circles that are larger are in the more upper middle class neighborhoods in Washington, DC that are predominantly white. And as you move east of the river where it's darker, you can see the dots are getting smaller, uh, indicating that households are earning less. In terms of types of housing in DC, again, if you overlap uh, the life expectancies in, in Woodley Park compared to St. Elizabeth, you'll find that in the Northwest section of the city, you'll have more single family households compared to east of the river where you see the darker, more burgundy colors indicate apartments. Um, and we also know that in DC has the, is the most rapidly gentrifying city in the United States. This slide indicates food deserts and watershed, walk sheds. Um, east of the river, you'll see that there are con high concentration of food deserts, whereas as you move to the center of DC, as well as uh, to the northwest of DC, you'll find that there are far more walk sheds where someone can reasonably walk to a store or to transportation. In terms of the racial divide in the city, uh, in regard to black and white students, this is a comparison of black students to, to white students in terms of the region where they live in the Washington DC metropolitan area. So in the, in the orange, you'll see that black students are 15.2 times more likely to be suspended than white students. And then on the bottom chart, you will see that black students on average are 4.9 grades behind white students in the district. And again, just to reiterate, nationally black students represent 31% of school related arrests and in DC are 15 times more likely to be suspended and expelled from school than white students. 
In terms of black boys who experience downward mobility, uh, this is a study that was that was um, published in the New York Times, which found that even when black and and black boys and white boys grow up rich, that they are black boys are more likely to be to move into as as an adult to become poor. Right. So if you look on the right side, you'll see that as uh, adults who start out rich is roughly 1,550 white men, which was 40% to 690 black men. But as you move down to poor adults, you'll find that black men are overrepresented among those who end up poor as adults. In terms of the racial wealth gap in DC, White households have a net worth of 81 times greater than black households, which is roughly $284,000 to $3,500. So across the board, we not only see that there are disparities in terms of health, there are also disparities in terms of wealth. In terms of the concentration of poverty among blacks in DC, you also see that the concentration of high poverty has increased over the past 45 years and if we look from 1970 to 2015, we see that Blacks have increased by 13% in the high poverty category compared to 1.4% of Whites. And this is where the rubber meets the road with the population that I work with in terms of how they become involved in the criminal justice system. On average, 45 Black people are searched and frisked every day in, in the District of Columbia compared to just two white people. But if you think about in terms of the proportion of Blacks versus whites in the District of Columbia, it's relatively equal. And what's also interesting is that Blacks, although they are stopped more times, they produce less contraband and are cited less, but whites who are stopped much more infrequently produce far more contraband than those stops. So the stops are not based on data or driven by data. They're primarily driven by systemic racism and racial ideology, where Black men, particularly Black men, the intersection of their race, their gender and age is weaponized. And so I saw, uh, a quote the other day, which essentially stated that even though black men may be unarmed in terms of being shot by the police, both fatally and non fatally, there's their race, gender and age weaponizes them. So in a sense, they're never unarmed. In the District of Columbia has the highest rate of incarceration in the United States among cities. And you can see that it's almost double the incarceration rate in the United States. So in terms of how the healthcare system and criminal justice system intersect, what I found in a study that I conducted among black men who were treated for violent injury at the University of Maryland uh, R. Adams Cowley Trauma Center in Baltimore, among 191 men, we found that the most significant risk factor for bringing a young man back to the hospital was a history of incarceration. And one of the reasons why we think that's critically important is due to the collateral consequences that are associated with felony disenfranchisement. And so uh, the Judge Alexander Williams Center recently conducted a study on the collateral consequences of what it means to have a felony. What they found is that there are over a thousand collateral consequences if a person has a felony. And also in the state of Maryland, a recent study by the Justice Policy Institute found that Maryland ranks highest among all states in terms of the incarceration rate among young black men between the ages of 18 and 25 years old, higher than Mississippi, higher than Georgia, and higher than South Carolina. And so what are the collateral consequences of having a felony? Well, one, it's the inability to get legal employment. If you have a drug felony, the inability to get a Pell Grant. If you have a drug felony, the inability to have access to public housing or live with someone who has public housing. The inability to vote where you're often disenfranchised in terms of voting, or you have to pay enormous fines in order to gain, regain your voting rights. And, and then, also, there are issues in concern, concerning also licensure and getting vocational licensing, 
uh, in terms of collateral consequences. And then last but not least, my colleague uh, Diva Pager, the late Diva Pager found in her study, Mark, that black men who have a college degree and no criminal justice record have a, le a less likelihood of getting a call back with having the same resume, have less of a likelihood of getting a call back than a white male with a high school degree and uh, a felony record, which essentially says that being black and male in the United States is the equivalent to having a felony. This clip will show the intersection of the criminal justice system and the healthcare system among the young men that I work with. So when you got shot in March of 2015, what was the day like then? It was just, you know, when they shot, I knew I was hit off the break. I got hit, I was the first one out of the crowd, got hit by, got shot in the arm. So I knew I was hit. Was they just firing at the crowd? Nah, they were just, they were just coming out of nowhere. We ain't know who they was. We just thinking like, well, they had no police to say police on their on they vest or nothing like that. So when they came up, we just, we ain't know who they was. So right. we just got to shoot them first. Okay. You know? And then the they, whole time is the police, so the police shot started shooting. How often do the police do that in hoods? Let's like run up, you don't know who they are, they just running up on you, they not saying, yo, we the police, no badges, no nothing. Yeah, they do that, they do that now, you know, in DC, they do that now. They be doing that, it's called a gun unit. The elite gun recovery unit's mission is to get illegal guns off the streets, but recently their tactics have come under scrutiny. So they just hop out on your ass for guns, make you lift your shirt and stuff up, or see if you got a gun or something on you or something like that. But they doing that now because they wear regular clothes, so you don't know what's going on. Anything can happen. Exactly. That's why. That's saying? the point I was trying to get to. So you don't really know. That can happen to anybody on anybody. any given day. It only got to be no street person. It could be a regular person that got a whole job. It could be a lawyer person. It could be anybody. You don't know. Anything can happen. I got locked up three months after I got injured. So what was that like to get locked up and you were still dealing with your injury? I, mean, I could walk. And I, I kind of knew a couple people that was in there. So it's like I knew I wasn't just going to be, you know I'm saying, just thrown in there for real. So I, I could walk. I couldn't really like run or like jump and stuff like that. But even while I was in there, I was, I was still going through like the stuff they taught me in uh, the rehabilitation. I was still doing that while I was in there, like putting the blanket on. And I was just trying to rehab myself in there. OK. Yeah. When you got hit that time by the police, did you get any charges for that? Yeah. You got charge? Yeah, I caught a charge. Did you have to do time for it? Yeah. How long did you that have to do? 36 go? months for it. One of the aspects of what we're doing is looking at the kind of the intersection of violent injury and trauma, but also criminal justice involvement because we have a disproportionate number of young black men that come into the trauma unit um, that are involved in the criminal justice in some way, shape, or form. They might have been previously incarcerated. They could right now be on papers, which means you know probation or parole or on a box and ankle monitoring. How do we um, begin to even address that aspect of trauma, of what it, what the traumatic experiences are to be incarcerated? And so once you got locked up like the three months later, how much time did you have to do? Uh, they gave me six months, but uh, I think I did five. There's supposed to be some new law where they were supposed to cut it in half, you could work in the kitchen, you get out in three months and stuff like that. But while you're in there, you're dealing with a whole bunch of other stuff. You're dealing with your, you know what I'm saying, emotions, demons, whatever you want to call it. So I, I got I got to push back to five instead of three, so. So when you say that, like, what do you mean when you say you were dealing with your emotions and demons? I mean, because you're already in there, so you can't really, you could go ballistic and try to escape, but there's no escaping. You could just got to do your time. Like they say, do your, do your crime, do your time. So you're in there, and you got other stuff happening on the outside, like, say, my little brother was going through it at college. You feel me? He's fighting. He fighting people and, and stuff like that. You can't really be there to save him. You just gotta try to talk him down on the phone. Then you get visits, random visits. And my mom used to come in there. Like first time she came in there, she uh, she's trying. I guess she was trying to stay strong, but she just started crying in there. But 
you are you and they with a whole bunch of you feel me, people like you. So it's like, as soon as she start crying, she that's already messing with your mental. So now you got to go back. You already gonna feel some type of weight as soon as you go back. Right. It could be the littlest thing like somebody change the TV on you, a chess game or a card game. They wear, you feel me? That's your snapping point. You're gonna break. How do we help the young men that have been incarcerated understand that the mere fact of being locked in a cell is a traumatic experience itself? Particularly, right, exactly. And for those who may have been in solitary confinement, been in the hole. Absolutely. Um, we have to go to where they are. We have to go to where they are, and we have to um, we have to be, you know, proactive because they're not going to come to seek help from us. So we have to go to the spaces where they already are. And we have to enter into uh, collaborative relationships with reentry programs where these men and young men are. And we have to, you know, take this information to them. Because many of them, again, they're, they're, if they've been um, arrested multiple times, incarcerated multiple times, the experience of being locked up and locked down is normative for them. They don't even see it as traumatic. How long were you in the hospital for those five shots? I like a month. And where'd you get hit? I got hit all in the back and one, four in the back, one in the arm. And so you in there for a month and then they transferred you to, to jail? To, to, to the uh, CTF, DC jail. Okay. And so what was that like going from the hospital, now you're in the jail? You know, you got, you got this picture, you got this, you know, you in a, you in a messed up situation. You know, because you going in there messed up, like you in a messed up situation. But, you know, you got this picture of big boy draws on. You know, your big boy bosses on it, man, you know. And man up like a man, you know. Mm -hmm. You got to make the bed up. The bed you make up, you got to lay in it. I was in bed mode. I wasn't even worried about it. I don't even think I was thinking about it. I got shot. I was worried about what the, what I'm going to do in here. You got to retake yourself in. You can't worry about your medical problems. You got to retake yourself in. You in jail now. So you all that out the window. You on a new stage, so like you gotta, you know, you don't think about it. like you. I ain't gonna lie, say you not don't think about it. you don't think about it sometimes, but you ain't on really like it don't be on my mind. So like it don't be on my mind. Like when I go to jail, I be thinking about jail. Like my focus be on jail because you gotta deal with the police, you gotta deal with this inmate, you gotta deal with this person, that person. So you gotta be on your P's and Q's. At any time that you had to go to the hole, yeah, I went to the hole for how long? I stayed in the hole almost almost like three four months. Then I went out of feds. When you was in the hole for that three, four months, did, did it affect you mentally? No, nah, I just did do I used to do push ups and stuff like that. Okay. And then you went to the fed for how long? I went to the feds for almost twenty five months. This is a lot to happen for you in three months. You get hit mm -hmm. and then three months later now you locked up. So what's going through your mind now that you, you locked up, you in your cell at night, you you hit Three months earlier, you still got to deal with your injuries from that, whatever situations for PTSD, and you and you incarcerated. What are your thoughts going on at that time? Mm -hmm. I just try to stay sane. I didn't really have too much thoughts. Like I really slept a couple months away because I didn't want to think too much. You feel me? Or do too much and stuff like that. So yeah, I just I wasn't really trying to think, to be honest. I gave a presentation two days ago to a group of. Uh, men and young men who have who all have a history of being incarcerated and um, the prompt was do you remember your first night in prison that's the question that I asked and what were their responses memories started coming out of all of them people started to talk about I remember the sound of the clangs and the clacks people started to talk about the smells that they remember People started talking about the voices of other inmates that they remember, the shouting, the yelling, the sounds, you know, the feeling of just all of this stuff coming at you and not knowing what was coming next. And so, you know, through that, I, I went right into, you see, all of these memories that you have stored in your mind and body, these are traumatic memories. Just the question of, can you remember your first night? Triggered it. The trauma that black men have experienced has been continuous for centuries, unbroken. First colony founded in Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. 1621, the first uh, enslaved Africans arrive in Jamestown, Virginia in shackles. 
And so the story that I was telling them is that this is a continuing trauma that has been passed down from one generation of black men to the next generation of black men to the next generation of black men. And you will be hard pressed to find a black man in America who doesn't have an uncle, a cousin, a brother, a friend, a neighbor that has not had the experience of being imprisoned or locked up. So those are some a few of the narratives of the ways that young men have experienced uh, the, the complex trauma of not only dealing with a gunshot wound, but in many cases, often, if, they, if particularly if it's police involved, a police involved shooting, often may have to go to, uh, to detention following um, their stabilization after they've been treated for their injuries. So you're going from one traumatic event of being shot to them being placed in another traumatic space being incarcerated. And so how young men navigate that kind of trauma is the issues which we're really trying to delve into. And I think our that was our psychotherapist for our program, Edward McCurdy, who works very closely with the young men in terms of trying to get them to deal with their trauma and developing coping mechanisms to address these multiple forms of trauma that are often structural. And so this uh, is a map of gun violence in DC in 2020. And as you can see on the right, on the left, those represent, the dots represent uh, homicides in DC as of July 17th, 2020. And then on the right, uh, shot spotter, which is a, a instrument that can um, trace where gunshots are coming from. You can see the concentration of, of where gunshots have occurred in DC, particularly in Ward 7 and 8, which are denoted by the red. As of today, or uh, last week, there were 180 homicides in DC. I think roughly for the year last year, there were 188. There's been a great deal of speculation about why gun violence has increased during the COVID epidemic. There are a multitude of, of, of different um, ex of reasons why gun violence has occurred dealing from high rates of unemployment um, to also the accessibility to guns. There were uh, at least 5 million guns that were sold uh, since March uh, as a result of the COVID epidemic and accessibility to guns. But also I think it's important that we personalize the number of people who have been injured by guns in the District of Columbia, as well as uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, where we just reached 300 homicides for the year. And so these are the barriers to recovery for our population. As you can see on the right, uh, environmental hazards, lack of education, inadequate food and nutrition, unemployment, poor housing and poverty. But one of the things that I also wanna to mention too, and I might be going out on a limb saying this is, we also have to begin to look at the, the collapse of the drug economy in most urban neighborhoods. And I mentioned that because structural violence and, and the impact of structural racism has, as we know, led to many individuals who are unable to penetrate the legal labor market having to rely on the drug economy. And now what we're seeing now during COVID is a collapse of that economy, which could even be one of the reasons why we're seeing even more of an increase and, and gun violence occurring in neighborhoods that rely on that economy. And that points to uh, structural violence and the reasons why people even have to rely on a drug economy to survive. So this is the cover of uh, a book that I've, I've written a book chapter in. It's, um, I have to give a shout out to Woody Kessel, who is a professor in the School of Public Health here at University of Maryland. He's also the former Assistant Surgeon General and my colleague Marie Crandall on why we are losing the war on gun violence in the United States. 
And so my chapter focused on my experiences building a hospital violence intervention program um, at Prince George's Hospital. And then one thing I would say out of my experience is there's the ways that I've even observed how hospitals can often engage in forms of structural violence in terms of blaming the victim. And so I would hear in many conversations among medical staff, the blaming of the victim for young men that were coming into the hospital without any recognition of the structurally violent conditions where they live and where they reside and how their communities are policed. And so my, one of the goals for my work is the Transformative Research and Applied Violence Intervention Lab, uh, which I have here at the University of Maryland. And we conduct studies that lead to interventions um, and innovative interventions. And so my first in intervention that came out of my research was actually the research that I conducted at Prince George's Hospital, which led to the development of the Hospital Violence Intervention Program there. And I'd like to thank all of my research assistants, Will Wakal, Napoon Kodaje, Masoor Saidi, uh, Mahir Chahori, and Che Bullock, as well as uh, Nick Galloway. And so one of the uh, articles that I published based on that research is the considerations that one has to take into account when conducting research in an urban trauma unit. And this was published by myself, Dr. Carnell Cooper, who is my mentor, is a trauma surgeon, and my mentee, Chris Sainville. One of the things that came out of our research was a short documentary, and I often like to use film. Uh, we created a short documentary, which was award nominated called Bullets Without Names, and it focused on one of the participants in that research study. And this is, his nickname is Smack. And this is actually uh, at the time that he was injured while he's lying in his hospital bed. Um, this is a pic of the colostomy bag. And, and I have tons of stories about young men who have to wear colostomy bags and often may wear colostomy bags for extended period of time. We had one young man who was uh, shot by the police, sent to prison, was wearing a colostomy bag, had worn a colostomy bag for his entire prison sentence, gets out of prison. Um, within 10 months of being released, he's shot again, comes back to our hospital, still wearing a colostomy bag. And it wasn't until my violence intervention specialist for our program, Che Bullock, realized that he was wearing a colostomy bag for well over six years, that he referred him to one of our trauma surgeons who determined that he should have had the colostomy bag taken off at least within months after it was placed on him. So he was uh, scheduled an emergency surgery and removed the colostomy bag. But you can imagine what the psychological impact is of wearing a colostomy bag for six years when you didn't really have to do that. And that, again, is an example of the structural violence that occurs not only within the healthcare system, but the correctional healthcare system as well. This is uh, my mentor who gave me access to the trauma units at, at Shop Trauma in Baltimore and PG Hospital, Dr. Carnell Cooper. He was the one of the first trauma surgeons in the United States to create a hospital violence intervention program and provided me with access to the trauma, to the trauma centers at both hospitals, which led to the development of the program that I co-founded. We were also published in the Huffington Post, and you can find that this article in the Huffington Post in terms of what hospital violence intervention programs are doing to stop gun violence. And uh, this is just an article which found that hospital violence intervention programs uh, significantly can reduce the rate of re-injury. And in this article, it found that uh, among people who were in the hospital violence program, their re-injury rate was 4% versus the historical uh, re-injury rate among the control group, which was 8%. So at my hospital, the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program, we had 745 victims of violent injury per year. We were among uh, 40 HVIPs in the world and the busiest level two trauma center in the state of Maryland. Uh, this is our uh, organizational chart. So it's myself as a co-director along, along with uh, Dr. Ronnie Benoit, who was our medical director. And we have a program manager, a clinical counselor, a social worker is Edwin McCurdy, a credible messenger and a caseworker. And what we provide is trauma-informed care. 
mental health and substance abuse counseling, employment and educational assistance. And I asked for his housing assistance because it was very difficult for us to find housing for many of our young men who are from the District of Columbia, primarily because it's such a housing crisis and shortage. And we often found ourselves sending young men back within 24 to 72 hours back to the same neighborhood where they were shot. So you can imagine how traumatizing that experience can be. And then legal assistment, assistance, we have pro bono attorneys working with us and then peer support and violence interruption. Uh, ward seven and eight on the left are in wards five are the uh, wards where we primarily receive our patients. And then if you slide that uh, map on the left into uh, as a piece of a puzzle into what we see on the right within the beltway of 495 and particularly those neighborhoods that are, uh, are in green, those are also catchment areas for our patient population. This is just uh, from 2014 to 2018, how many people that we treated for violent injury and you can see across the board, it's roughly even a third for G gunshot wound, a third for stab, and the third for blunt trauma, but on our five year average was 746. And you can see in a total of over five years, we had over 3,700 people that we treated for violent injury. It's a lot of people. So, in terms of our health outcomes in the healing process, we had 116 young men that were involved in our program. We only had one person come back for a violent injury, which was a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, based on the fact that when we started, our trauma recidivism rate was 32%, which meant that one out of every three patients who came in for a violent injury had been there two or more times. We had one uh, victim of a homicide, which I'll discuss later. But if you do the math of one person out of 116 returning to the hospital, that's less than a 1% trauma recidivism rate. And as I say, when we started, the trauma recidivism rate was 32%. So we use a patient-centered outcomes research approach, which focuses on empowering patients and also a researcher to practitioner approach where I work directly with uh, my staff as researchers and Che Bullock and I co-produced this digital storytelling project. This is an article which my graduate student will recall and Che Bullock and I wrote on his role and in influencing the lives of young men in our program and connecting them to services. And as was mentioned in uh, the first clip, they often are distrustful of the healthcare and criminal justice system. And so he, because he has the shared lived experiences with this population is able to bridge that gap to keep young men engaged in services. And so we use a, a credibility and a culturally competent approach so we believe in um, employing people that are violence intervention specialists that have lived experiences in the communities. And they often increase the uptick in services because they're able to forge trust with our patient population. And this is a picture of these two handsome gentlemen, the most handsome guys on the right. And this is uh, Che in, in a room with a 15 year old kid. I wanna tell a little story about this kid. He was shot and uh, unfortunately, uh, when the police came to investigate the shooting, which they often do, which we're, we're now uh, studying law enforcement involvement in, um, in shootings, he was in, in, interrogated without the presence of a legal guardian, even though he was 15 years old. And I think that this was the day that he was actually interrogated by the police. So we're at, so we're working as well um, in our structural violence, structural justice curriculum to address the ways that law enforcement often in a hospital setting will engage in trying to interview uh, victims of crime and using an approach as, as if the, the victims are offenders. And what we'll see in trauma in the trauma bay is when the police assume that somebody may die, they may often try, if this trauma surgeons allow them, they may often try to interview a person while they're being operated on or while they're being prepared to be operated on, which to us is just one of the most egregious protocols and policies that hospitals allow police to engage in. This is, uh, again, this is tip uh, with, with Che, he's now a patient uh, transporter in the hospital. Uh, this is an article we recently published called Staying Out the Way, which focuses on 
the use of Uber Health and what we started using through uh, our interviews and focus groups with our patient population is that Uber Health was a critically um, important form of transportation for our patient population. Uh, we did another, another paper, which we recently had accepted on uh, traumatic stress. And then I'll just move on to the last clip. Have you ever been tempted to go back to the life you was leading before you was hit? This every day. I didn't really like change what I was doing. I'm still doing what I'm doing, but I just, I'm just not all the way out there now. I guess you could say that. Like, you feel me? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to progress. I'm trying to go to, you feel me? Do doctors meeting therapy sessions and come here and, uh, you feel me? Get involved with the program. Still try to look for job. Like, I'm trying to just build back up to where I need to be. I, a lot of people ask me what I got for dreams. I, I ain't got no answer for. It. I don't waste the time out here that I had that actually make sure I was set and had a foundation for myself. And that's what a lot of these young dudes need to understand now. It's about, you know what I'm saying? This street shit, man, that shit always gonna be there, bruh. You, you know, it, it's niggas older than me that still, older than y'all that, that jump out there now. You know what I'm saying? That shit ain't going nowhere, ever. But this time that we got as you, and the time that we got, right, like, that we living, this shit, man, this shit come and go so fast, boy. It, it's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous, and it's not to be wasted. This shit ain't to be played with, bruh. Like I said, my, 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 my dad. I ain't, see, I ain't got no story to tell, bro. That's all darkness. You know what I'm saying? So the best thing that I can take away from that, bro, is ain't, ain't nothing, ain't nothing better after this, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like unless you make it better, and the only way you can do that is by staying in the positive light. Because I was in that, I was in that pit, and I was about to sleep in that pit. It was dark, it was dark boy. It was dark, so dark you can hear your thoughts. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, that kind of dark. Mm hmm. So that's the best advice I could give, man. Just, you know, I know it's hard. Just do your best, man, to limit your interactions with the bullshit. So the trauma-informed care approach says that there are three stages of trauma work. And the first stage of that work is safety and stabilization. So a young man is shot, goes to the hospital. Um, let's say he wasn't, you know, uh, catastrophically wounded, but it's just, you know, the bullet went straight through. He's patched up, stitched up. He's going to be discharged from the ER maybe within hours of coming to the hospital in some instances. Um, but he's got to return to the community where he was shot. And so if he doesn't feel safe um, to go back home, to walk back into the same building where he was shot outside the front door of that building, then he's not going to be able to address, address his trauma symptoms because he's going to be triggered over and over again. Every time he walks up to the front door of that building, he's going to have a, a traumatic memory that triggers his post-traumatic stress symptoms. After the time that you were stabbed, had you ever experienced after that time like an inability to sleep? Like you may see, hear, hear, hear a noise, or you don't want people to get too close to you. You avoid certain situations. Yeah, it was like that before the stab. Like I said, I got shot before me being stabbed, but I was in the same places. I got shot in my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? So. And coming up the way I did, it's like, your neighborhood is all you got. You know what I'm saying? So I'm right back where I got my ass shot. So what we want to do is make sure that we can have him in a space where he feels a sense of safety, security. I'm not in danger. And, and unless and until we do that, you can't really do any work on the person's trauma because their PTSD symptoms are gonna be triggered over and over again because the environment where I was hurt is the same place where I'm returning and I'm expected to heal. Well, it's very difficult to heal in the same environment where you were hurt and injured because every day you have to walk down that street, you have to stand on that block, you have to open the door of that building and your traumatic memories are gonna flood back into your mind and you're gonna re-experience your trauma all over again. So first we want to stabilize the person, make sure that they feel safe. Then we get them into a place where we can process the, the memory of the trauma. That's where therapy comes in. That's my job, my role, is to sit in a room with a person and help them process their traumatic memory in a way to where they learn to cope with it. I could talk about it, 
But if I show it to you, now yeah, you see, okay, I got 12 symptoms of trauma, and you just told me four of them, five of them, say it again. are things that you deal with every day, right? So once again, the question is, how do I cope? So, so you've participated in, I want to say, two to three, you know, different uh, therapy sessions, mm -hmm. right? How is it just being able to, 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 to talk to someone about how you feel, like how it make you feel once you leave? <sighs> It's overwhelming, man. It's overwhelming mm -hmm. because you get you get people that I mean, you get a man that generally wants to know what's going on with you, mm -hmm. like and really looking at you and talking to you back. He's not just mm -hmm, okay, oh yeah, I got you, but he's giving you feedback back. You know what I'm saying, and actually was on your mind. It's a beautiful thing. You know what I'm saying. You don't get that all the time. Like but you, like but you, it's the mm -hmm. same time. You know, you don't get that all the time. So once I I sat down and talked to him, it was easy to talk to him. It just flowed. Mm -hmm. It just flew, you know what I'm saying? It was like, I'm looking at myself like, damn. I would never thought that I would be in this position right here, right mm -hmm. now in 2018, into 2018, man, because I was on a downhill. Mm -hmm. you know? So they learn breathing techniques, they learn self-soothing techniques, they learn ways in which you can calm your body when you're triggered through your trauma. And that takes months of work to help a person get to that place. And then the third stage of trauma work is uh, the person finding a mission for their life. I've experienced this terrible thing in my life. I've worked through it. Now, I have to reconnect myself to the things in my life that have meaning. Like back then when I was running the streets, well, I thought my purpose was to be in the streets. If you go anywhere in South Beach and you say my name, they're like, oh yeah, I know him. I done protect a whole lot of people. I done helped a lot of people, all that, man. So I thought my purpose was the streets. That's why I stayed out there so long. That's why I did what I did, done what I done. Was what it was. Uh, if it weren't for y'all, man, I'd probably still be out in the streets. So I'd probably be, be locked up because I probably went to war with whoever. I was willing to go with any neighborhood, whoever. Real life. For one, y'all saved my life, man. I have to start back hanging out with my friends. I have to start responding to text messages when people invite me out on a Friday night because when we're experiencing trauma, we tend to withdraw. We tend to isolate ourselves. We tend to shut the world out. So stage three is opening yourself back up to the world. Friends, family, social situations, making meaning out of your life, finding work that you enjoy, um, using art to process your therapy. It's all kinds of ways that you can do it. And you run a hospital now, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, you though. Yeah. You do. Pretty much. Well, I mean, let's do what I want. I kind of run the house for that. Real life. So, what do you mean? What, what does that mean? In, like, if you look at your life, right? You was in that bed. You was hit. Mm -hmm. Now you in the hospital. You work there. Kind of running. Mm -hmm. what, does that, what does that say to you? Man, change is possible. Anything is possible. Like, real life. That's what they say to me, man, like, man, how bad you want it, basically. Everything, I, ever since I've been working there, everything I said I was going to do, I done done. Like what? And I got my own spot, got me another car. Man, I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm good, man. And how's your daughter? Excellent. Excellent. Good, good, good. good. All of them excellent. Good. If your daughter, you know, once she is able to understand this and your kids that you have now too if you would want them because they're going to see this one day what would you want them to know about you and your life and the message you would want to get them and i changed for them i changed for y'all 100 any bad stuff you hear about me <laughs> it's true but i changed all that at age 35 i changed What's up? That is it. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Richardson, for that most informative and uh, significant le lecture. Uh, you really have brought this topic uh, in a very uh, direct manner to our attention. And uh, again, we appreciate the hard work that you are engaged in and the wonderful benefits that this work is. Uh, is beginning to see uh, over all these years that you have been at it. So now, if with your permission, I'd like to open it to questions and answers. Is that all right? Sure.
Okay. So, uh, well, the first person just said that was phenomenal. <laughs> so, uh, and this is the time for the audience to ask questions, please. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, what is the duration of follow up with these uh, victims of gunshot wounds? It varies based on the person. So, you know, you could have some people that their issues aren't that challenging. And what we try to do is kind of triage who we're going to work with and uh, provide services to. And that becomes pretty difficult too, because when you have 745 people coming into your trauma unit, you have to decide, okay, we only have three, three staff members. Who are we going to provide services to? And so we get, we need to begin to triage how we decide who gets the services and who doesn't because the majority of people will not get the services. And what we found even very early on is that we had far too many people and not enough staff and people were in our staff, they were getting burnt out. And so what we try to do is uh, assess who has the greatest, the most significant risk factors. And one of those things would be, have you ever been injured before and hospitalized before? Have you been incarcerated before? Um, is it in the past where you, were you uh, intoxicated at the time of your injury and had a positive toxicology report? Do you ascribe to the code of the streets, which is a theory by Elijah Anderson says you have to respond to respect with aggression and violence and then last, uh, have you ever used or threatened someone with a weapon within the past 12 months? And, and once we go through that, we determine who we're going to work with. And then the VIS, the Violence Intervention Specialist, kind of determines, okay, uh, they determine and a clinical counselor determine how long they're going to stay with the person. So it could vary, but we need to move on because we have more people coming into the door constantly every day. Thank you. So we have a uh... Question from Asha Davis. As someone who is interested in working in the medical field, how can I equip myself to develop structural violence competency? Great question. Um, what I would say is that I start with the literature on structural violence um, uh, and, and do your best to understand what that literature means. And then also I think it's really important to just begin to think differently about how violence is framed. I mean, for me, for so long, I've been conducting this work as a gun violence researcher. And one of the things, the slides that I didn't really get to was the, the lack of funding for gun violence research. Um, and so since in 1996, there was the Dickey Amendment proposed by a Senator Dickey from Arkansas, which basically said that the the government, particularly the CDC and the NIH, could not fund gun violence research because it was considered as a form of gun control. And so for almost 25 years, gun violence researchers have not been able to get substantial funding to conduct gun violence research to even frame these issues around structural violence. And so what we'll find is that, you know, we, what you'll see is that we often kind of blame the victim and we don't lay the blame at the hands of society. And I think structural violence provides us the opportunity to shift the blame from the individual, to shift the blame to the structure. And so I would just encourage um, everyone to, you, to look at that literature, but also to begin to think differently about the ways that we construct violence and using the term structural violence in our everyday language. Thank you. Uh, Beth Gway, have there been other trauma centers reaching out about starting their own programs? There have, and I've consulted for with several programs even this year. When we started, I think there were roughly 30, I mean, we, we may have been at 32nd, and we were, um, we were accepted into the National Network of Hospital Violence Intervention Programs in our first year, which is, typically not normal. Um, a program has to be up for at least like three years, but we were doing such a phenomenal job that we were accepted into that program in our first year. So yes, there's a national network of hospital violence intervention programs. Also, there's the Healing Alliance um, Violence Initiative, which is called Javi, which our program 
HVIPs are a part of along with uh, safe streets. But one of the things that I would emphasize as well as the sustainability factors, if you do choose to build a program, because in the state of Maryland, uh, Governor Hogan recently vetoed the Maryland Violence Intervention Prevention Fund, which was supposed to provide $3.6 million to two hospital violence intervention programs in the state, one at Prince George's Hospital, the other at uh, Shock Trauma in Baltimore. Uh, so Hogan vetoed that bill in the third year of funding. So those the, this year, they lost all of their funding. And so now I'm working with the Maryland Violence Prevention Coalition in terms of uh, working with legislators and adv advocacy experts to try to get violence intervention prevention funding as a line item on the state budget. Thank you. Daniel Webster asks, what is the most surprising thing you have learned from the young men you've interviewed? Anything about the situational factors involved in the shootings, why the shooting occurred, connections with prior shootings and the like? So there are various reasons why shootings have occurred. What we're seeing now more than they're just like arguments that happen and, and the argument can go from zero to 60 in a matter of five minutes and you have two young men that are armed um, and then one young man happens to shoot the other one. But then once we, that person is hospitalized, if they are and they're stabilized, the next thing that we have to be really concerned about is the retaliation factor. And so how do hospital violence intervention programs connect with violence prevention programs and outreach workers um, that are do the work in the street and within those communities to prevent the retaliation from occurring. And one of the other things that I would mention too, you know, I had asked some of my guys, you know, why is gun violence going up during COVID? And one of the reasons what, which I got, which I haven't heard this narrative being presented and I, I discussed it in my presentation is the collapse of the drug economy in many neighborhoods. So what you're finding is the actual cost of drugs is actually skyrocketing. So it's a supply demand issue. Um, haven't heard that narrative yet, but from my interviews with many of the young men that I work with, that's one of the things that they're citing as well in terms of why we're seeing so much violence happening in the street and the accessibility to automatic weapons that we typically haven't seen on the street before, like assault rifles are being used, the number of people that are being shot multiple times. You have guys that are shot 10 or more times now. So it's the lethality as well. But thank you, Daniel. That's my colleague. Thank you for the question. Uh, from, and I apologize if I mispronounce names. Uh, from Niana Rasayan, Dr. Richardson, does your team offer any training for ER physicians to better understand this cycle of trauma on AA men? African-American men, sorry. Great question. So we are developing, as I, I mentioned in the, earlier in the presentation, I'm working with uh, trauma surgeon, Dr. Tanya Zacherson, who has funding at the University of Chicago to develop a structural violence, structural competency and structural justice uh, um, curriculum, which we'll be uh, piloting with trauma surgeons and medical students in Baltimore and Chicago. We're just in the very beginning, initial stages of developing the curriculum and putting together a community advisory board. So we also think that the community should be involved in developing the curriculum. So we're reaching out and identifying community advisory board members, but we hope in the long run that the curriculum will be used with ED physicians and trauma surgeons to understand the implications of structural violence and what happens when you're operating on a young man in, in, in the trauma bay and within 24 to 72 hours, they're discharged back to the communities where they were injured, where they're suffering from uh, structural violence. And the last thing I would say about that, many of our young men are like the best social scientists I've ever met. Uh, without having the PhDs, they clearly understand the implications of structural violence. They just don't have the language like I would have or another behavioral social scientist to articulate it that way. But they understand that they live in communities that are that are set up in ways that are violent and have caused harm to them for well before that they were injured by a gun or a knife. Thank you. We'll take uh, a few more. Uh, Jerome Dances asks, what has changed during the pandemic? And you said a little bit about that, but is there more you want to say? 
Um, in terms of gun violence, I mean, we have seen the spike in gun violence. One of the things that I think is critical for us to understand, as well as how the healthcare system and the criminal, well, we know how the criminal justice system has responded to the COVID epidemic. It's not been great, right? The disproportionate number of people who are incarcerated have been infected and not released. But what we also need to understand is how the healthcare system has responded to gun violence during the COVID epidemic. So you have trauma surgeons, EMS, as well as violence interrupters and outreach workers who have had to shift over to doing more PPE work, which is taking them away from doing violence intervention work. But how has COVID affected people within the healthcare systems that are, are focused a great deal on gun violence and now have to have to shift their responsibilities to split between a dealing with COVID and dealing with gun violence as well. And so you've seen, we've seen articles that are coming out of like, for example, New York City, where there are a high rate of cardiac arrest that are COVID related and that EMS have to make, you know, these decisions in terms of resources. How do you, who do you respond to first? Is it the cardiac arrest? Is it the GSW? What hospitals can take which patients, right? So these are all these are all issues and challenges which we need to understand better as we're experiencing the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Thank you. Maya Kearney asks, were family members, loved ones involved in the study in any way? Why or why not? If so, what was the impact? Yeah, so we have we have caregivers. In fact, we um, we we're still we actually interviewed a caregiver of of which was the romantic and partner of Slim. And she talked about very uh, eloquently and viscerally about her experiences living with someone who was injured multiple times. So he was shot on two different occasions and stabbed once. And she had, they have a daughter together. And so her experiences with vicarious trauma are experiences that we need to address. And in fact, we have conducted focus groups with caregivers. And what we found is that the mothers, the wives and the romantic partners offer suf often suffer in silence because they have no one to talk to. And in fact, when we did our focus group with that group population, we found that many of the women were really emotional and, and, and treated the focus group as if it were a therapy session. And so what we got out of that is that we need to start uh, developing caregiver uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and mental health. So we started a caregiver therapy program that I, I think we did it twice a month for our caregivers. Thank you. Um, so the next one is from Sherilyn Stevens. Um, how many men have you helped thus far in it? And is the trauma reaction and response the same in women? Uh, do you know of incidents of women, men, and children subject to gunshots? Great question. So with our program, we treated primarily 18 and over and predominantly were young black men. But what we are seeing in the current phenomenon, at least in Baltimore City, is we're finding that far more uh, women are now victims of interpersonal violence, particularly uh, firearm related violence that's not IPV, intimate partner violence or domestic violence related. And so I have a colleague who uh, works at a, with another program, it's program manager at Johns Hopkins Trauma, where we're finding a significant number of women that are now coming into the trauma unit who have been shot. But what's interesting about that population that, that he works with is that they form their own support group, which is what you will not find with men. So they've informally created a support group among women where they provide emotional support with each other for how to deal with traumatic stress. You will never find that with men because men have been socialized just to keep their emotions so close to the vest that you'll never find those kind of just informal organic groups that emerge among men that support each other. Not saying that it's not a possibility because there are healing and help seeking groups among men that have been uh, created out of uh, the work that we do, but women are doing a much better job. We're finding at least preliminarily in supporting each other in terms of dealing with their traumatic stress. Thank you. Diamond Hawkins asks, I'm interested in criminal justice reform. 
Are there any opportunities for students to get involved and learn a little bit more about the work? With me, or is it just in general? <laughs> just general question, but certainly you can answer it that way. <clears throat> um, we're, I mean, I'm always looking for, for interns. I mean, we've, our, in fact, our program has been really successful because we've had so many amazing interns that have worked with us. And I, I would, you know, from Jordan Costa, Bethel Perhain, and Poon Cotage, um, uh, I can name uh, Carnella Fobbs. I can, and I don't want to continue because I'd be here all day naming people that have worked with us. But I mean, we have had just an amazing group of interns that have, that have really kept, in, in many ways, have kept our program alive because we lost a number of our, of our staff um, just through just attrition and, and burnout. And the interns just did and did an amazing job of just keeping the program going in terms, even in terms of like Uber health, like scheduling the Uber health and getting people in con and, and placing people in Uber health. So yeah, I think it's definitely the opportunity is there. Um, I think this is a similar question. Julia Spiegel asks, what can we do the younger generation to combat this structural violence in our, in our society? One of the issue, things that I would definitely advocate is to really work with legislators in terms of the violence intervention prevention funding. And as I mentioned, Governor Hogan vetoed that bill. Now in other states, progressive states like California, where they've made significant reductions in gun violence, they have that kind of state investment. And so we need more young people to engage in, in, in activism and advocacy around how these programs are sustained, particularly in a state like Maryland, where you in Baltimore City, where you have high rates of gun violence, but yet there's no response, at least from a funding standpoint, on how the states are going to include that in their line item budget. And then the other thing I would say is just keep that term structure, that concept structural violence in your everyday language. I think we really need to change the way that uh, politicians and policymakers think about violence. Violence isn't just limited to fist, stick, knife, gun. Violence is also institutional and affects certain groups, which is which they can engage in preventable harm. And so as long as we keep pushing the narrative that structural violence precedes interpersonal violence, I think that we'll be in a good place. And I'm also teaching the class next semester. This is my own, uh, my, my own shouting myself out. I'm teaching a, a class next semester on structural and interpersonal violence uh, in black communities. So if you're a student at UMD or you want to audit, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. I, I think we can only handle two more and, okay. and then we'll stop there. So from our colleague, uh, Dr. Virga Sangramuthi, uh, gun violence research, especially in the context of health and medicine, is still dominated by white researchers. Do you have any thoughts about how to foster and open up opportunities for researchers of color to do this work? Excellent question. And uh, I think you know, at least from my from my position as a gun violence researcher of color, I try to support as many emerging scholars as possible. And in fact, I, I kind of take pride in that. I'm I'm placing more emerging scholars of color in the in the pipeline. But I definitely think that that's a structural issue as well um, in terms of getting more scholars of color to be engaged in the work. But one of the things that's kind of structurally affected just not just not specifically based on race but across the board is the lack of funding for gun violence research which has affected researchers across the board particularly scholars of color because there was there's really been limited funding for gun violence research which would often prevent people from going into the field because they might see this occupation as not being sustainable but i think we need researchers who can speak directly to the issues that are occurring in in these communities and not have a, a, not give their own perspective from 30,000 feet, but actually ingrained and immersed in within those contexts and can speak culturally and structurally in a structurally competent way to the problems that um, 
black and brown people experience in terms of gun violence. So I advocate heavily that we need to change the structures in terms of even how we recruit our PhD students um, and, uh, that engage in public health or medical anthropology or CRIM to provide students of color the opportunity to engage in this kind of work. Thank you. Last question, Marcy Deloche, another colleague. Great work, Dr. Richardson. Based on your research, what has been the impact on violent recidivism on the participants in your program? So we have, uh, we didn't do an RCT, but just based on, that's a randomized controlled trial, which is, not, which is the gold standard for determining the effectiveness of hospital violence intervention programs. But based on the 116 people that we treated over an 18 month period, we had one person return for a violent injury. And as I mentioned in the outset, our trauma recidivism rate was 32%. We reduced that to 1%. And so I just want to emphasize again, the healing process. I think you heard a lot from the clinical counselor as well as you heard from the young men themselves about the ways that the program changed and they literally said the program saved their lives. And the last thing I would also offer as a solution, and I think this is really where the rubber hits the road. The young men that I worked with asked and demanded that the program be placed on this campus, on the University of Maryland's campus. Like this was a life altering experience for them to come on this campus because it provided them an opportunity to be exposed to a campus that they may live 15 minutes away from, but they've never been here. And so I think it's critically important that the universities that support this kind of work in terms of research also support it in terms of research, in terms of resources. And what you'll find in many HVIPs is that they're at level one, research one center. So Yale, University of Chicago, you have these top elite, top flight elite schools around the United States that provide the services, but are they really getting young men involved in the campus climate? Right, that to me is the most significant barrier. If we're really going to address structural violence and structural racism, then we have to address that particularly for universities that are land grant universities that have to be responsive to the community. We should be opening up the university community and the resources to this population because trust me, it makes a difference. They've said it to me that they would like to be part of the university community. I've had many of my, my young guys guest lecture my classes and I know that it's a transformative experience for them when the university offers the resources that they would offer the, the general population. Dr. Richardson, I can't thank you enough for this amazing presentation. It's always good to have you speak at the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, and we look forward to having you back in, in the not too distant future. And we wish you all the best in your very important research and the hard work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to tell our um, viewers about our next um, scheduled virtual events that will be happening beginning in January where uh, we you can see them listed uh, on, on your screen. Uh, we have the first one on, in January in regard to Syrian refugees in the Middle East and in Europe, uh, the, psycholo the psychology of a humanitarian. <clears throat> and then uh, February 16th, uh, Professor Stephen Thomas will speak about racial inequalities in health. Uh, April, March 2nd, Dr. Alice Evans will talk about progress in gender equality <clears throat> across South Asia over the last century. March, we have uh, Dr. Evaristo Benyera, uh, who will address uh, structural violence and his is based along human rights and uh, uh, reconciliation um, programs. Uh, March 30th, um, Dr. Saraya Aharoni, who will speak about women and peace. And finally, Dr. Devi Shridhar, uh, global health inequalities in the pandemic. So we really encourage you to keep checking our website as we are getting um, 
these programs organized to make, to make available to all of you. And also please consider following us on our social media. Thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in January. And thank you again, Dr. Richardson. Goodbye everyone.